Hello, everyone, and welcome to the August 2022 meeting of the Howard Astronomical League. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, and you could view it on YouTube and go right to the HAL uh, uh, website and to the, right there on the front page. Uh, Ken has it posted with the link to the um, to the YouTube, and uh, and uh, you you could review it. Or if for those who missed the meeting, um, you're already looking at it. So otherwise, you wouldn't have heard this. Okay. Anyway, so 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 welcome everybody. And uh, let me get started. We'll start out like we always do with a little astro humor. <laughs> there you go. Uh, all right. So um, we'd like to once again welcome our, all of our members and regulars. And are there any new members on tonight? Raise your hand, unmute yourself, introduce yourself. Any new members? Yep, new member <clears throat> about uh, a month ago. It's uh, my name is Bob in Indianapolis and uh, got turned on to you by, by uh, a friend. So I decided to join and this is my first meeting. Well, welcome. And do you, you have any optics? What do you like to look at or study? Uh, just, well, just restarting. I've got a um, eight SCT uh, on a uh, polar mount with guiding. And I've had some fairly decent uh, photography nights, although lately it's been, I'm in Annapolis. So we've had clouds almost every night. So. So uh, looking forward to fall. There you go. Well, welcome. We're thrilled to have you. All right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, another Bob here. Another Bob. Hey, Bob. <laughs> yeah, uh, new member as of this week. Um, kind of new to astronomy. Uh, really just kind of learning my way around the sky. I got a pair of binoculars, bought a bunch of books, and, and jumping into it. Well, great. Well, welcome. So uh, we... we um, there's plenty to learn from this group, and there's a lot of different things that uh, we do that uh, will give you good experiences. And uh, you know, bring your binocular out to our uh, our events and uh, enjoy the sky with it. So, yeah, so great, so welcome. Can I say something? We have lots of Bobs on today. There's at least four. So, um, uh, the new member Bob that just joined. If you're interested in uh, binocular astronomy, uh, the Halo Observatory, we have a library and we have several books on binocular astronomy. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can uh, either uh, get, to the, uh, get to the Halo when it's open or uh, give me a call, get in contact with me and we can arrange to meet. Thanks, Great, thanks. Why don't you... Uh, Type your contact information in the chat. Sure. And then um, Bob will be able to pick it up from there. Sky and Telescope Magazine also has a really excellent monthly column on binocular astronomy every month with new stuff to find. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. So we, so we heard from four Bobs. Oh, there's a uh, Victor's holding up his binocular highlights book. So maybe we get Jim to change his topic today to uh, binocular observing. So, uh. sure, All right, any, any other new members? I'm not a new member, uh, but I, I've been a member for a while, but I haven't been to a meeting in a long, long time. This is Alice, so uh, glad to be back. So Alice, we're happy to have you back. Hope to see you a lot more. Any guests today? All right. Well, once again, welcome everybody, and we'll keep moving on here. Once again, here's a list of your officers and your committee chair people. And as I say every month for the last three years, and I'll continue to say it is, you know, nothing happens by magic here. And I, most of the time, the most visible person to all of you um, because of all the meetings and events, However, these are the people that are really getting the, the work done and keeping everything current. And um, 
our club is great because of the work that they do and really appreciate it. So thank you. Uh, do any of the um, any of the folks on this list uh, have any announcements you'd like to make? Hearing none, we'll keep on going. Well, um, back to Bob. As I uh, have said, we have a uh, very good library. It's open to all the members. Uh, on this page, you can see uh, the uh, uh, way to get a hold of me. So, uh, hope to see more people using the library. Right. It's in really good shape now. Right, and I believe there's a list of the the books and the materials and everything that's on our website. That is correct. So, well, Bob's done a, a great job of. Uh, actually putting the library together from scratch and managing it ever since. So thank you. All right. So uh, you could see that uh, we're winding down through the season here already for our star parties. But a week from, a week from this Saturday is our next member star party. Um, and then September 3rd is our next uh, public star party. So uh, let's... Uh, Hope that we have really good weather like we did for that impromptu and it would be and it would be and it would be awesome so so um and keep your eyes open for some impromptus for nice weather uh, uh there's been a few people that have been opening up regularly and it's great for the rest of us any questions there so um, I want to remind everybody, and I'm going to turn this over to Hannah, that, uh, you know, as part of our social media with our website and Facebook page, um, we also have uh, Instagram. So, Hannah? That, I just like to say, that is unbelievable Photoshop. The, re the resemblance is uncanny. So, thank you. That's just spectacular. Um, yes, <laughs> it's, that is that's good stuff. I'm putting that on my website. Um, so for uh, those who don't know me, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm the social media chair. Phil kind of likes to joke that I showed up to a public star party um, in 2021 and just never left. And I guess it's kind of the case. Um, I run, among other things, I got the HAL Instagram um, up and running. Uh, it's a great way to kind of, you know, keep the public, recruit from the public, but also keep them updated. Uh, to you know all the how happenings whether that be uh most recently the object of the month um kind of competitions that some of our members do where they source out usually a messier object um to image and then uh kind of compare them all at the end of the month and i get to display them on our instagram account um we get to build great relationships with people in the community right now i think some of our most notable followers um the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, the Maryland Science Center, um, the uh, glass plate archives uh, at the uh, Harvard Observatory, which is home to all the glass plates, if you're familiar with the Harvard computers, um, and just a lot of, you know, really great people in the community. So um, please share any, whether it be drawing sketches, uh, you know, iPhone pictures, setups, uh you know landscapes deep sky really anything that you want regardless of how you know what it looks like i think it's great to convey um the excitement and just like the broad um interpretation that people uh or how people are impacted by um the sky so uh feel free to submit i can drop you can find the instagram account it's um hoco astro like howard county astro um but you can find the link and the submission form um, on howardastro.org, uh, the league's website, and I can also drop that in the chat momentarily. So thank you, Phil. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Hannah? I tell you, Hannah, you're doing a, a great job with this and uh, everybody appreciates it. And uh, one day I will uh, be uh, a, a good Instagram user myself, uh, learning. Well in the meantime, your family's good Instagram users and they like all our pictures. So there I see the like and name show up a lot. There so. you go. But yes, um, feel free to share it to anyone who even just like, regardless of where they live, um, if they're uh, passionate about space or find space interesting, it's, um, I'm a little biased, but it's a good account. Of, to follow, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
Phil, Phil, try try to get Rocky to show you how to use it, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, sleeping on the floor here. He's asleep with excitement. So, all right. So, uh, Hannah, you're a good straight person when you were talking about um, um, our Discord group. Uh, Jared, I don't know if you, I don't see Jared on today, but uh, Jared Case actually uh, got this started. There was a presentation on it last month. By the way, I did watch... Uh, uh, last month's uh, presentation on YouTube, Victor, and uh, and all the guest speakers, uh, Wayne and and Jim, and um, um, there was a there was a third person too, I believe. So, um, but it was great, and um, and there was a presentation on the Discord group, and this group uh, chooses a picture or an, an object that they're going to image during the month, and then they vote amongst themselves on who had the best picture of the, uh, of, of the month. And uh, Jared actually won in July. So these um, obviously are gonna be a month delayed in our meetings because they don't vote till the end of the month. But uh, this is really quite a spectacular image right here. And if you haven't opened this thing up from the uh, Discord site or from the posting that was, uh, that was done uh, and bring it up full screen on your computer, it, it's just awesome. So this is another uh, social media activity, and this one's really an interactive one that's going on all the time. There's quite a, no, quite a number of people that are doing this. So for uh, people who are new to this and new to imaging, um, don't let that scare you off. <laughs> There's a lot of learning that goes on in here, and these people have uh, years of experience, and um, but we all learn from them. So you don't have to have uh, uh, this kind of... Uh, skill set developed in order to have a really nice time imaging. Before you leave, before you leave that picture, Phil. Yes, sir. Right, if you look right at dead center in that image is the uh, pillars of creation, that little tiny thing in the right in the center. Right. Yeah. 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 That is just really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to jump in and say, this is a really spectacular image. When I first saw it, it was like the moon shining through clouds because he's removed all the stars, of course, from this image. And the other thing I wanted to say is, is the August uh, object of the month is the Eastern Veil Nebula in GC 6992. So if anybody wants to jump in and start imaging and participate, please come. It was very interesting at the last impromptu star party. And by the way, for those of you who are new, an impromptu star party is when the skies are, looks like they're gonna be clear. One of uh, our key holders, um, uh, which we have about a dozen, maybe a little bit more, uh, who have the ability to lock the park and open the park if it was locked already, um, will call an impromptu and you just go on out. That's a members only benefit. And if you're not on the impromptu list, you have to go on the website and um, into your account and uh, say that you want to be part of that, and uh, you'll get on that. You'll get on that um, distribution list, so you'll make those announcements. That those are not sent out to the general uh, world. But anyways, yeah. So um, and I was going to say uh, at the last impromptu, um, all the people who are working on these uh, for the Discord were. It was interesting seeing the. Uh, more than a few telescopes all pointed up to the same object. You don't usually see that in our parking lot. And I didn't realize at first until I asked why everybody was looking the same place, but uh, they were they were working on the veil. And now, well, without further ado, we're gonna move to our guest presenter for the night, our own Jim Tomney. So uh, I'm gonna, uh, uh, read this introduction for Jim. Uh, you could also find it on the website. Uh, so uh, as a Jovian enthusiast since getting his first 60 millimeter refractor in the 1960s, Jim has spent hours behind the IP sketching and pho pho photo photographing uh, the fa this fascinating planet. He will be sharing tips on viewing Jupiter that he has learned along the way and provide an overview of features the amateur observer might be able to see for a variety with a variety of instruments. There also will be a primer on getting into imaging Jupiter using video cameras and opening source software. By day, Jim is a software developer currently working as a contractor for the Social Security Administration. He is currently serving as Hale's second vice president and has been a member of the club since 2014. 
is a longtime member of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. He is currently serving as their assistant coordinator for the online section where he processes the images and sketches submitted uh, and sketches submitted by observers around the world. He also pens astronomy blog, Shallow Skies, where he offers his take on the joys and challenges of exploring the night sky amid boreal eight light pollution. So another one of our talented and very involved and much appreciated members. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jim. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can start sharing yours. Welcome, Jim, everyone. Alrighty. Thank you, Phil. Let's see if I can get my share going here. There you go, we can see it. All right, let me shrink this up a little bit. And hopefully somebody can kind of keep an eye on terms of the the chats if anybody has questions on this. So yeah, Phil kind of gave the, the background here, um, you know, total amateur here, you know, and just yeah, a I real Jupiter. Find my, um, I would like to do my plugin so I can be private. Uh, guys, mute, mute yourselves, please. If, yeah. uh, if you're uh, not muted, come off mute if you have a question, obviously. Um, so at any rate, let's let's dig into this and kind of explore Jupiter. And what I'm going to cover tonight, there's going to be one section where we're going to talk about what you might be able to see behind the eyepiece, depending on your scope. I'm going to do a real quick run through of uh, how you would get into imaging, kind of basically show my uh, process that I use for imaging. And then also hopefully have just a, a couple of slides to talk about people who really don't have telescopes or, you know, aren't really interested in going out and looking, but have other ways to follow Jupiter and explore it. So we'll try to dig into that a little bit too. Uh, let's see, can I, I wish I could get, anyone know how to get rid of this top thing on Zoom here? No, that, uh... It's just going to be in your way, but no. All right, so it'll be in the way. That's fine. All right, so basically, Jupiter for amateurs is one of the prime targets. Uh, this is data that I compiled from the Alpo website over two years of observations, and you can see Jupiter by far and away has the largest number of observations. So why is that? Why did people really enjoy Jupiter? First thing has to be the size. Um, it's just huge. At uh, 44,000 miles across the uh, equator, 41,000 polar. So you can see that there is a little bit of a difference there, which we'll get to in a minute, but you can basically pack over 1,300 Earths inside of this planet. And even the great red spot, you know, the most iconic feature on Jupiter is larger than our home planet. So that translates into a good size at the telescope. Um, Jupiter's orbit does have some uh, eccentricity to it, uh, or not, uh, not too much, but certainly more than Earth's. So just like Mars, when you have a Mars opposition, when Mars is near perihelion, you get a much better view. It's not as dramatic with Jupiter, but the same thing does apply. You have basically a difference of seven arc seconds. So the next perihelic opposition is coming up in 2023, next year. So kind of it's on the horizon. You can use this year to kind of get ready for that. And even if Jupiter is at its smallest, which is when it's getting close to solar conjunction, it's all the way on the other side of the sun, it's still sub 10, 30 seconds of arc, which is still a pretty decent size. So you can observe Jupiter kind of, you know, until it gets swallowed up by the glare or the trees in your neighborhood. And in terms of visibility, this planet is reliably observable for eight months of the year, you know, unlike Mars and Mercury and Venus, which tend to go away for longer periods of time, you've got eight months. Now, some of that time you may have to get up early in the morning, like I've been doing recently, but in general, you can get a good view of Jupiter about eight months out of the year. It takes uh, just under 12 years to complete an orbit, but for it to return to roughly the same spot in the sky take a little over here. And so basically Jupiter is going to kind of transverse the zodiac one constellation, one uh, sign at a time. Um, in December of uh, 2024, the next opposition won't happen until 2026. So here's a list of all of the uh, upcoming oppositions. And like I said, that one next year is going to be 
the closest. And then we have this year in Pisces, the closest. So the other thing is that this is a very bright object. It's the fourth brightest object out there behind Sun, Moon, and Venus. And that can make for some beautiful uh, photography for when it has a conjunction with either the moon or like this one here with Mars. So it's very, very uh, photogenic. The other thing is that a nice bright target makes it much easier for imaging. You can get a higher frame rate, which then gives you a better chance of getting um, that one, you know, if you get microsecond good seeing, if you're running at a very high frame rate, you'll get multiple frames of that good seeing. So that's good. And at the eyepiece, the consequence of being so bright is that really, uh, it's a good idea to take some sort of a filter to knock some of that glare down so that you can kind of pull right. out the Don't details a little bit better. The other thing is that it has cool features. Um, what you can see down here in the little video is I think Ganymede cutting across the planet. Those Galilean moons are easy to see and they do these transits and then other times they will cut in behind Jupiter's shadow and they'll have an eclipse and even an occultation where it comes up along the bright side of the limb and it actually just disappears behind the planet. So those are cool. I mean, that's really pretty much the only planet that has that available. The cloud bands, which uh, are fairly easily seen, and these change appearance from apparition to apparition. They're not static. So it's kind of neat, you know, after it comes out of solar conjunction, you, you know, we get the telescope and it's like, what, it, what surprises are we gonna potentially find? Uh, over the three to four months that it's been out of view. And then of course we have things, features uh, beyond the bands like the great red spot and storms. And these things can last for years, they move around, sometimes they merge, sometimes they change color. So really cool features uh, to uh, look at on Jupiter. So in part of this talk tonight, what we really need to do is to kind of orient and kind of get a little bit of the, the naming conventions down. So we're gonna take a couple of minutes to do that. I do wanna mention uh, this book, Planetary Astronomy by Christophe Pellier. I got this back in, uh, I think December. And um, this is a great book. If you are a planet person and uh, you wanna, whether observing or imaging, um, this guy has done a phenomenal job of putting together a, a definitive work. I mean, it really should be on your bookshelf if you're a planetary astronomer. And I've just kind of scratched the surface on Jupiter on it so far. So highly recommend this book if you're a planet person or if you wanna learn more about the planets. All right, so these belts and zones that Jupiter has, basically this is set up because of Jupiter's very fast rotation. That rotation, and it's kind of a fluid body. It's not, it's not like Mars or the moon where it's you know a solid feature that we're looking at. It's really spinning quite rapidly. And this sets up jet streams within its atmosphere, just like on Earth, we have a couple of jet streams. On Jupiter, there are 16 prograde jet streams. So in other words, those jet streams flow with the rotation of the planet. There are an additional five retrograde jet streams that go in the opposite direction. So what that leads to, their combination can kind of set up what they call a slow moving current or a domain. So you can see in this uh, image here from Christoph's uh, book, you end up with a couple of jet streams heading the prograde and then a retrograde in between. And you end up with this slow moving current. So this current is just kind of slowly like a stream. You know, you've all seen at the arcade with the little duck thing, you pick up the duck. So it's basically these little features here, these knots and condensation and storms are like the little ducks getting carried along in the stream. And so you have basically a series of these uh, currents. And here is uh, the breakdown. You have obviously a very large equatorial current, then a north tropical current, north temperate current. So there are a variety of currents and not, and they don't all go in the same direction. So it makes for some very interesting observing. Uh, other thing is that Jupiter spins fastest along the equator. You know, the, the high spin, it basically bulges out a little bit and it's moving the fastest along the equator. And what that sets up is that you're moving slower at the higher latitudes 
and faster as you come down. And you can get a situation um, where you can actually see one storm passing another because it's in a faster current. And here's uh, an example from Christopher Hook uh, from the BAA. He posted this couple couple days ago. These images are four days apart. And if you look at the one on the left, you see that you've got the great red spot. And then as you go down, you've got two more white dots. Look at it four days later, those guys are all in a line. So basically the great red spot, which is closer to the equator, it's running over towards the left. So it has caught up with the others. It's the same thing with this one in the middle there. It's also moving, though not quite as fast, but it is caught up with the slower one on the bottom. So it's it's really cool and dynamic that within a period of a week, you know, you can sometimes see these sort of differences. More so photographically, because you know it's a little hard to catch on some of these images. But even so, uh, if you're like uh, looking at some of the major features, like for example, you might see a barge or something like this, you can definitely see these changes. So again, very, very dynamic planet. So kind of relating. Uh, the weather on Jupiter on a macro scale to what we see here on Earth, um, you've got basically the pairing of a belt and a zone, like what we saw on the prior slide, into a large uh, unit of atmospheric convection called a Hadley cell. And basically you've got vertical circulation of the air due to temperature differences. So your warm air is rising, it cools, and then it sinks and it dries out. So here on Earth, we have like a large Hadley cell here, two of them, north and south. And so the air rises and then it comes back down over what basically are like desert reasons. Of course, as the air sinks, it's going to dry out. So on Jupiter, the white zones are gonna represent ascending air. So, and as the air rises, it's going to cool. And what that's going to do is to form ammonia ice, which is white. So that's why your zones are white. The belts are where that air is then beginning to drop down. The belt is drier. It's descending air where those white ammonia ice uh, crystals have dissipated. And so the bands are where you're looking a little bit deeper into the planet. So here's a diagram from um, Sky and Telescope. You have, of course, the central meridian. If you hear me say meridian or central meridian, we're talking about if you were looking at Jupiter and you took a line right down the the middle across the poles, that's the central meridian. And on the left side, they talk about the zones and you can see that we have symmetry here. So you have your equatorial zone and then the next zone south is the south tropical zone, north is the north tropical zone. Same thing with the belts. You have the south equatorial belt, the north equatorial belt, the south temperate belt, the north temperate belt. So, you know, uh, and I've got the link down here and all of the slides will obviously be on the site with these links. And uh, at the end of the sli slide deck here, I have some references. So this is a great uh, simple diagram of Jupiter. One other thing I'll point out here is uh, astronomers will often talk about the preceding side and the following side. So on the left-hand side here, that would be your preceding side. So in other words, things that have preceded across the disk. On the right-hand side, things are following. So where the great red spot is here in this diagram, that's on what we would call the following limb. So we're, again, not dealing with terrestrial features here. So we really are kind of looking at cloud features. You know, what sort of interesting shapes or forms in the clouds can we potentially pick up what sort of things repeat uh, when we're looking at Jupiter. So here's a diagram um, from um, Richard Schmoody, who is part of ALPO, where he's, he's listing out some of the various types of features that you can see. And on the right, we have a couple images from Christopher Goh, who is a fabulous uh, imager, uses a 14-inch Celestron out of the Philippines. So we can map some of these features to Chris's uh, image here. First thing is a barge, a uh, little rod-like, a very dark area. Um, last year, the op during the operation, there were tons of these things. This year, not so many, very few of them. You can have an oval. There are plenty of ovals. Um, again, 
you may have a little trouble picking it up visually, but if you put in a little practice and effort, you probably can pick out some ovals. Condensations or little knots, uh, that's kind of the inverse of an oval. Loop festoons, this is where you have uh, material from the belt kind of making a graceful arc and falling back down almost like a solar prominence. Uh, condensation, whoops, and we already got that one. I'm, 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 I'm catching them as they, I'm muting, I'm muting them back, Jim. All right. Uh, this is a little hard for you to see on the screen. I probably should have gotten a better one, but uh, if you download the slide deck, there is like actually a little tear in the north uh, equatorial belt here. That would be a rift. And then finally, here's an example of what we would call a projection. So as you're going along the belt and then there's like an outcropping, so you have projections. All right, so let's get into the visual observing. What could you potentially see behind uh, the eyepiece with your telescope? Well, let's talk about what's needed. First of all, obviously, you've got to have a telescope. Um, there are various factors in terms of what makes a good telescope, but at the end of the day, size really is king. Size really makes a big difference. Um, a refractor is going to be better than a Newtonian reflector, which is going to be better if it has a small secondary mirror than a uh, schmidt cassegrain with a large secondary. Large secondaries tend to lose a little bit of contrast. It kind of it kind of blurs ever so slightly. But the bottom line is, a 10 inch is always going to win out over a six inch. And here I have a just for comparison, my six inch scope uh, versus a, uh, the, the 10 inch scope, you know, not only larger, but if you were to look at it more closely, a lot more detail. Collimation is always important. So that's an advantage to a refractor. You don't have to bother with that. But if you have a Newtonian, you really want to tweak and make sure that your collimation is spot on. Even if you have a schmidt cassegrain if you want to get the best to try to see some of these subtle features, you want your collimation on point. You want to have a decent eyepiece. Um, you know, a good plossal would be fine. Uh, orthoscopic eyepieces are classically uh, planetary eyepieces, um, but I've done a lot of my observing with good plossals, uh, so they work fine. You need a stable mount, and ideally one that is also tracking. Uh, doesn't have to have guiding, but it has to have tracking, so that. You, you can keep, if you can keep the planet in your eyepiece, in your field of view longer, that's better. You can do it with a Dobsonian, you know, you kind of have to do this bump and let it flow through, bump and let it flow through. Um, it's a little bit more difficult doing that, but I've done a lot of my observations doing that kind of an approach. Things that are optional, but which I definitely would recommend, like I said, the tracking so that you can keep the planet in there for a while, you know, study it for a good 5, 10, 15 minutes. And because of the brightness filters. I think a yellow filter helps overall, but a blue filter to me, because those bands have a little tinge of like reddish to them and blue is going to block that and it's going to boost the contrast. I think blue filters really do kind of help you to pull out the most that you can see structure wise in the bands. And the number one thing which we can't order online from Amazon is steady seeing. Um, the sort of stuff that we had recently where it was like 95 degrees and hot and humid during the day, and it would be kind of hazy at night, those can be great, great times to, to look because the atmosphere, it is like a blanket. It's just laying there. And so you can get some really steady seeing. So don't discard those kind of nights. They can be some of your best nights. Hey. Um, the other big thing is you're going to need patience if you're going to do IP observing of Jupiter because you're going to take time to, to learn a skill here, just like you wouldn't expect to pick up a musical instrument and play it within five minutes. You know, do this multiple nights and spend at least 10 to 15 minutes studying it, maybe more. I mean, I plenty of times I've spent a half hour watching the planet. So you got to have some patience and really Take time to let your brain absorb what it's seeing, let your eye get adjusted. It all comes together if you start having patience and really taking time looking. Hey, Jim. Yes, sir. I throw a little love out for uh, uh, for for refractors there. Oh, yeah. I saw a refractor, a large refractor, um, you know, four inches or larger. 
a high quality one with good optics. The resolution is spectacular. It and is. You can really pick up sharp detail. You can put Barlow on there and still hold yep. your detail. You, once again, steady skies are key. But uh, so um, refractors work great on the planets, especially in Jupiter. Refractors are awesome. You know, they're pricey, but they are awesome. I mean, I am amazed at times what I can see with my 80 millimeter small scope but you know like you said they tolerate the higher magnification better. you know so you can put a barlow in there and a relatively high power eyepiece and you know it's just it's great absolutely so what i'm saying here a small scope 80 millimeters to 120 millimeters if you've got a refractor in that range you've got a great scope you know definitely be able to see some of this stuff medium 125 to 200 so what 200 is a uh, eight inch 225 to 275, and then 300 and above, would we're going to classify that as extra large. I uh, already mentioned that Jupiter has one of the fastest rotation rates. In the equatorial region, it's running at about nine hours and 50 minutes. Elsewhere, so we have like two systems of longitude. Elsewhere, it's system two longitude, which turns in nine hours, 55 minutes. There is actually a system three, which is based upon radio waves that we receive from Jupiter. And scientists believe that is kind of like the, the actual core that we're picking up the rotation rate of the underlying core. And so system three, a lot of times um, is kind of looked at as like truly the, the true longitude of the planet. So one of the things you can start off by looking is, hey, can I see this little equatorial bulge here? You know, the centrifugal force is causing a bulge at the equator. I don't know if you can see in the slide here, but if you were to put Jupiter in a square, part of it's going to be outside of the square. So if you look at it, um, you know, see if you can pick up the fact, hey, yeah, you know what, this isn't just a perfectly round planet. The equatorial belts, they are very obvious for the most part. Um, the north equatorial belt is usually um, thinner of the two, but it's more intense, stronger. And you can see in this image here that I've got from, I, I don't know which one this is, but basically the upper belt there is the northern belt and it is more intense. And that's, that's pretty standard. Um, right now it is thinner than it's been in a long time. So it's almost been cut in half. And right now we're kind of monitoring that northern edge of the north equatorial belt to see if it's going to, to blossom and bloom back out. Um, there was actually in the HAL uh, email list this morning, a uh, mail from uh, James Willingham about a, an eruption in that belt, uh, one of many that occurs. And you know maybe this is the one that's going to start to spew out more material and the belt's gonna to start to grow. So it's always interesting to kind of keep an eye on this belt uh, and it might, might do something spectacular this year. We don't know. We'll keep an eye out on it. The um, South Equatorial Belt, usually wider and not as prominent. It is right now. It is wider and uh, it's not quite as prominent. But we have kind of like large macro weather uh, systems, weather patterns, kind of like we have El Nino you've got similar sort of patterns that we picked up on Jupiter. So the great, uh, the SEB, South Equatorial Belt, does a disappearing act. Like about every 15 years, it undergoes a set of, of like two fadings about over a four year period. So you start off with like the image here on the left where you've got a very prominent wide SEB and then something happens and remember Jupiter is very dynamic in terms of the heat radiating from up out of the planet. So it's probably not something solar radiation wise. It's probably something that is occurring on a seasonal basis with Jupiter where that Hadley cell up there, that convection gets broken and breaks. Basically, you start getting the ammonia ice clouds covering over that area where the belt is. And so you get the image here on the right hand side. And then after a while, all of a sudden, um, it will uh, burst forth. There'll be like a little barge and boom. And I saw one of these, I think it was in 93. And it's amazing, you know, a little spot erupts and then it just bleeds out and restores the belt. The last time it happened was 2010 as we're showing here. 
So 15 years, 2025, you know, if you start getting into looking at Jupiter now, you might be right involved with watching and documenting this SEB going through another one of its disappearing acts. And here is uh, from the last fading uh, infrared from the Hawaii Infrared Telescope. The one on the left, you can see, look at how much cooler the SEB is. Um, you know, it's really not showing at all. White is hot in this image compared to after it is restored, we're back to looking deeper and into the hot area where the belt is. So then the moons are always a blast, as I mentioned earlier. Ganymede um, is large, larger than Mercury. So if you have a small scope and you want to catch a shadow transit, look for one where Ganymede is doing it because it is very large. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I got the 80 millimeter out just to, specifically to see how well I could see it. I won't say necessarily it was a piece of cake, but it was pretty easy. You know, you uh, I put it in at 150 power and definitely could see that black dot there. So that's that's definitely an easy and fun thing to see. Jim, when we get to the uh, submitted pictures uh, later tonight, uh, James Willingham submitted one and you could actually see detail on, on, on that particular moon in the end. I think he, Ganymede, yes. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I got one the other week too, where one of those nights where it was really good seeing, uh, my 10 inch even picked up a little bit. It's just, it's great fun, you know, to think that you're seeing not detail, but shadings on a moon that far away. It's phenomenal. If you happen to just point the scope out there and you see a black shadow, odds are it could be Io because Io, uh, every 42 hours, I think, crosses in front of Jupiter. So it's a very frequent transitor. A lot of times you'll pick up Io shadow. In hey, terms Jim, of an eclipse. Yep, Jim, yeah. so, sometimes you have a north up and sometimes you have south up in the images. Is there a reason for or a convention or um no it's just my inconsistency oh, okay um there in general it, it's weird you know for mars for whatever reason the community tends to put south up i don't know why uh jupiter most people will put north up and that realistically is is probably the best go. um but yeah uh i should probably on my sketches know which way is which <laughs> so anyway the for an eclipse where basically the moon is falling into Jupiter's shadow, just like you know a lunar eclipse here on Earth, the best time for that is when you're at quadrature, which is basically <coughs> three months before opposition or three months after. And the reason for that is that the alignment is such is that we're peeking behind Jupiter and seeing the most of the shadow that we can. So the eclipse starts further away from the limb of Jupiter. As you start to get to opposition, the eclipse is much closer to the uh, limb of Jupiter, which can make it a little harder to see. The other fun thing is something called mutual events. So whenever Jupiter is kind of at its equinox, the moons are kind of in alignment and they will interact with one another in that they can occult or eclipse one another. Here's a great video from Clyde Foster, who sends a lot of his stuff into Alpo, a little video that he did in the most recent set that was last year, showing, I think that's Ganymede getting eclipsed by um, Callisto, but I'm not sure. So very cool to be sitting there and to be able to see in your telescope, you know, the, uh, the one moon basically take out the other one. And then the great red spot, everybody's favorite feature. Um, like I've mentioned, this guy you can definitely pick up in a uh, small uh, quality refractor and all across the line. Um, if you're having a little trouble seeing it, a blue filter can sometimes help. Right now is a great time if you wanna catch the great red spot because it is not always red. Maybe large, but it's not always red. Here we have an image from 2006 from the late Don Parker. And you can see, I mean, it's just totally washed out. Um, you know, you really kind of get the idea that the gray spot is there simply because there's a hole, you know. Uh, whereas this current apparition, it's pretty red and it's pretty visible. So the picture there on the right was taken last month. So this is a good time if you want to see the red spot to get out there and look at it. And so let's take a second to talk about the great red spot. It's basically an anticyclonic storm some 
1.3 times larger than Earth, as we mentioned. And the wind speeds, I think, are clocked in at about 275 miles per hour around this thing. It's, it's been around for centuries. I mean, we have it well documented that it was seen in the 1800s. Um, it towers above the cloud tops of Jupiter. Um, I think it's like five miles uh, above the cloud deck of Jupiter. So if you look at something in methane light, um, objects that are high are going to be very bright. And this image that was released by uh, the Webb Space Telescope, I think this past week, clearly shows, and, and even amateur uh, photos in methane, this thing is sitting way up there, very high up there. So it's very high. The other thing is that it is shrinking in size. So if we go back to some of those 1878 uh, drawings and people doing transits of when it crossed the central meridian, they are pretty certain that it was over 25,000 miles wide in, in its uh, length. Voyager in 79 measured it at 14.5 thousand miles. Hubble, 2009, 11, we're down to 11,000 miles. And going back into the Alpo archives, here's a picture from 1964, and you can see how large that looks compared to James Willingham's photo from the other week, you know, or the other month. That red spot has definitely shrunk a lot. It's still intense, but it has definitely uh, been trimmed down. And in 2019, we began to see maybe part of the process at work. We don't know that this causes all of the shrinkage, but there's an uh, incident called flaking, where basically a storm, uh, smaller, much smaller than the red spot, but still powerful, will come in, kind of graze it or collide with it, and tear off like this little flake from the outer periphery of it. And so we're thinking, you know, this may be part of the process that is causing it to gradually shrink as it goes along. What's interesting is that you might think if it's getting smaller, you know, trying to uh, conserve the angular momentum, that as it gets smaller, like the classic ice skater doing the twirl, bringing their arms in, that it would be start speeding up. Actually, what they have found is that it is getting taller. So you almost think of it like a chunk of clay on a potter's wheel and you start applying and, you know, it starts coming up. That seems to be what's happening with the Great Red Spot. As it's shrinking, it's growing taller. Not spinning faster, but it's growing taller. And Juno, oops, don't know that I've, all right. Juno uh, did some recent studies, like in 2019. We originally thought that the Great Red Spot was kind of thin, like a, like a pancake sort of thing, sitting on top of the atmosphere. It's deep. It runs, uh, according to Juno's data, anywhere from 180 to 300 miles deep into the atmosphere. So this is a substantial storm, and we certainly have a lot to learn about it. One of the things that we need to learn about, what makes it red? And in short, we got theories, but no proof yet in terms of what's happening. The really um, current theory is that there's something going on with UV light hitting complex organic compounds in it and turning it red. So you think of like Pluto and uh, the other thing that we saw, Ultima Thule or something, they had uh, organic compounds that over many, many, many years, the light, even though the sun's far away, the UV light kind of breaks down and changes the chemistry so that you end up with compounds that are generally reddish in color. So that's the general thinking in terms of what's going on here. And if you look at Jupiter in the UV light, it's not reflecting it back. You can see here, it is definitely absorbing it. So it all kind of fits together that there's something going on because this thing sits so high above the clouds, it's getting, it's getting a sunburn and it's turning red. All right, so let's go on to the things that are maybe a little bit more subtle, a little bit more difficult for you to pick up, but not really terribly hard. There's the North Temperate Belt and the South Temperate Belt. So again, kind of going out, and you know, we've done the equatorial belts, so let's go out now. The North Temperate Belt, okay, normally is very visible. I usually don't have trouble seeing it. Right now, this apparition, you can barely, I cannot see it in a 10 inch, and I've tried very hard, filters and the whole deal. And when I take a picture of it, I can just barely see this very faint orange thread here. 
So the North Temperate Belt right now is in the middle of one of its phase. It doesn't have them as predictable as the South Equatorial Belt, but it's now definitely faded away. So again, another area to kind of keep your eye out for, hey, are there changes? Am I seeing an eruption? Is something going on here with that belt? Am I suddenly able to see a portion of it? The uh, South Temper Belt is visible. On occasion, the South Temper Belt will have like little breaks in it, but by and large, it's visible. You can probably do that, um, I would say, easily with a, with a six inch, eight inch on up. Um, you might have a little trouble with a smaller scope, but then again, a, a decent night, you probably, like Phil was saying, with a nice refractor, it's probably in the game too. And then we have the South-South Temper Belt, which is a very active region. A um, lot of storms usually in that. Um, that one is pretty visible too. You should be able to see it. That one, I think, would be even more doubtful in a, in a small aperture. Another fun thing to do is, can you pick up the Galilean moons as actual disks? Um, of the group, like we've already mentioned, um, Ganymede is the largest and the brightest. So just at the eyepiece, can you pick out which one is Ganymede? And then you can go check it later and see whether you're right or not. Um, can you pick out Callisto, which is the dimmest out of the moons? And often, because it's the furthest out, you'll see it further away from the planet. And uh, like we were just talking, Phil and I, about a large aperture, you might not be able to see it visually, but you definitely, if you're imaging it, you may pick up on a good night shadings on Ganymede. If you have a really extra large scope, like 12 inches and up, you might be able to do it visually. The other thing that I'll just throw out here and we'll look at it in a moment is that when you're looking at Jupiter and you're trying to get a good focus, do a moon because you know, trying to get that moon nice and tight as a little tiny disk, that is a great way to achieve a sharp focus when you're studying the planet. So the second largest storm on Jupiter is called Oval BA. And um, this, you definitely could do it with a medium-sized instrument. I'm pretty sure it'd be extremely challenging with a small instrument. Larger instruments, it definitely should be doable. Again, all of this is are you being patient? Have you got a good night of seeing? That sort of thing, because these are a bit more subtle. But here's an example on the left of what it is looking like currently. It's not terribly contrasty. That's a subtle thing there. And the picture in the middle here is from a submitter to the Alpo who sketched, I think, a couple of years ago when it was a little bit more obvious. So as you can see here, again, from Pellier, here is BA sitting down here. It's got a little dark ring around it. Well, that's going to really boost the contrast. That's really going to make it a little bit easier for you to find the thing. Ah, one thing I did want to mention here. See the little blue? We had an outbreak of that in July on some of the images that I was taking that I'm seeing from others. That is called a hot spot. That's an even warmer spot than the belts. And talking to um, John Rogers at the BAA, that's even deeper. That's like the, that's like very hot, very dry, looking deeper, deeper into the planet. So you might actually, you may not see the blue color unless you've got a really large instrument, but you might pick up, um, you know, hey, I'm looking at the, the North Equatorial Belt here and there's this really darker region. Well, part of the reason it's darker is that it's like the slate blue color. So another cool thing to look out for. Hey, Jim, Bob Savoy has a question for you. Yes, sir. Hey, Jim, on that last slide, and the previous slides, what is the unit of measurement of the small, medium, large, and extra large? Millimeters, Bob. So an 80 and millimeter you. scope or, yeah. And so that's a refractor? It could be a refractor or a reflector. If it's a refractor, as Phil was mentioning, you're gonna have a much better chance at seeing these things. If it's a reflector, less so. If it's a, you know, if it's like a four inch Schmidt Cassegrain, do they even make, I don't know, or like an ETX, like an ETX 90, it's probably going to be a little bit more difficult. It's all just a spectrum. So, but I mean, I, I wanted to break it up in, in some sort of category. So I just basically went with, you know, like t shirt sizes for, you know, aperture. Um, but clearly, we have a guy in uh, Alpo who submits images. In fact, Gary Walker, right here, his on the bottom left hand side. He has, I believe, is it a 10-inch 
Cassegrain Maksudov, so like a Questar, but 10 inches from astrophysics. Uh, the thing I looked it up online is like thousands and thousands of dollars. But he does amazing work. I will never get this more than likely with my 10 inch Newtonian. So yes, telescope type does play into it. But again, kind of size, your aperture helps to know uh, what you can resolve and what you can see. Got it. Thank you. Sure. And Jim, just, yes, sir. just to summarize what you've actually been saying is that when you're looking at Jupiter, basically the darker the area is, the deeper into the atmosphere you're looking, just except, to summarize. Except for the great red spot. Except That's for the, the red spot. spot. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Definitely. So let's talk a little bit about Oval BA because it's got an interesting history too. It actually started out as three separate ovals. They, they formed back in the 1930s and for 60 years they drifted around and you know they would come close to one another and then they would like stop and back up. Um, you know, so it was kind of like, you know, a force field, you know, they couldn't quite get together and, and merge or anything. Um, However, and, and this is a Voyager image, and it points out here those three ovals. And I remember I have, I have sketches from back in the 90s of actually seeing these guys. Um, late in 1997, early 98, of course, when Jupiter's in solar conjunction and no one can see what the heck's going on, it turned out that DE and BC, so these things were named FA, DE, and BC. It turns out that Oval B, D, E, and B, C did collide and merge, and Hubble was able to capture some of that. So that's in the second panel here. So then we were left with F, A, and F, A poked around, and finally, I think a little about over a year or so later, it too managed to merge with the other, and so we ended up with B, A. So B, A is basically the amalgamation of those three original ovals that were there for well over 60 years. The other cool thing was that after it did this merging act back in 2000, about five years later, all of a sudden it starts picking up this red color. And so, you know, we called it Red Spot Junior. Um, so really cool. Now, right now, it hasn't been red for a while. On occasion, I see images coming in where it's like maybe a slight rose color, but, um, you know, keep an eye on it because it can change. If it's done it before, it can certainly do it again. And if we look at a methane uh, image of it, yeah, BA is again, it's not like the great red spot, but it is sitting up above the clouds. So again, it kind of feeds back into our hypothesis and supports it that something sitting up high there is getting hit with UV radiation and it's causing some sort of an organic chemical change that will colorize the spot. So something to keep an eye on. All right, and then finally, you know, in terms of some features that you might be able to pick up on, um, here's a sketch uh, that I did with my six inch, and you can see that you've got, you know, a barge sitting there. Uh, you've got a moon on the right side of the planet um, with the 10 inch here called a rift in the belt. This must have been at a time when the SEB was faint or non visible. Um, and then you also have like a thickening. Again, that North Temperate Belt, which I said you cannot see right now. Back then it was easy to see. And in fact, there was even a thickening region visible in it. And then on this one, a night of pretty good seeing, I caught a festoon, a little bay, and then a projection following it. So uh, again, you know, spending a little time behind the eyepiece, being patient. And especially when something's on that central meridian, that's the point where you really get the most details. You really wanna focus on that central meridian as stuff's going by. All right, now let's hit some tough stuff. So there are in the South-South Temperate Belt, a group of anti-cyclones. Um, there are also um, some cyclonic uh, white oblogan areas, CWOs. The bottom line is, is that this belt very often has got white spots in it. And they're a little tough to see. It, it would probably be challenging, even though I've got a red X here, you might get it with a six inch, but you know, it, it would be hard. You can see here, we have an observer, Paul over in England, who's captured them, but he's using a 20 inch scope. Um, if you have a small scope, like even a six inch and you're imaging, you can probably pick these guys up. But they are going to be a little bit subtle 
uh, to see. And so they're gonna be a bit challenging. And I'll just throw out here, here's another one of those uh, blue spots, hot spots. Corresponding in the Northern hemisphere, we have the same sort of thing. We've got storms up there, just not quite as many and quite, quite as frequent, um, but you can pick up on these too. Uh, here, Paul, who's a, a great sketch artist and, and a very dedicated planetary observer, he picked it up using his 12 inch. And you can see you've got fairly decent contrast here because this one here has got like a little circle of a rim of gray around it. So that helps bring out the contrast. So it's worth trying to go and see that. Uh, further down here, you've got, uh, this is Oval BA and this is like white spot six. So just plenty of activity again down here in that south, south temperate belt. And then finally, try to catch a moon as it's transiting Jupiter. This is tough. Um, most of the moons, their albedo level, by the time they get in front of Jupiter, it's like a chameleon, you know, it just vanishes. Even in imaging, it's very hard sometimes to pick up the, the body of the moon. I'm not talking about the shadow, but the body of the moon. The exception is when it's on the limb. You have limb darkening. And so as that moon is just beginning to ingress or it's just beginning to egress, try seeing if you can catch that moon uh, against, the, uh, against the planet, silhouetted, silhouetted against the planet. You might be able to do it. The one exception here is Callisto. If you want to try to grab a moon as it's going across Jupiter, once it's it kind of entered onto the disk, Callisto by far is the darkest moon. And so that's going to offer your best opportunity for a little contrast and being able to pick that up. Hey, Jim. Yes, sir. Um, and Jim Johnson, you may be able to validate this, but using Stellarium, if you were to, if you expand the image size on any feature in Stellarium, it'll bring out a great amount of detail. And with Jupiter, it'll bring out the moons. And if you let that run across the time that you're going to be out observing, you'll be able to see how the planets are moving, how the moons are moving relative to the planet Jupiter. And you could actually plan that event to start looking for it by using Stellarium. And, um, it, you know, so you could kind of minimize your luck on the timing um, as long as all the uh, clear weather gods and everybody are working for you. But that could be a good way to help plan it out. Jim, do you agree with that? I, I agree with that. Um, for the great red spot and um, uh, the moon positions and transits and eclipses and all those kind of things, I'm not sure about any other kind of features that you might see. I'd also mention that um, online Sky and Telescope has great resources for great red spot transits and the moons. Um, you'll, I've, I've got a link to it in my resources slide. But uh, yeah, you absolutely should you should plan, you know, I mean, it's wonderful serendipity, you walk out and, you know, you happen to have a shadow transit, but by all means, kind of use uh, one of the tools, either something like Stellarium, or go online and, you know, look and see what Sky and Telescope is predicting for the night. So let's jump into a little bit of an imaging primer or lucky imaging. Um, this is basically what I do. Uh, there are, excuse me, we have to get rid of the cat. Um, there are lots of of ways of doing this, multiple, multiple ways. This is just one way. And I figured I'd just kind of, for people who are interested in getting into it, because you can capture so much more detail uh, with lucky imaging, here's how you can go about. So what do you need? You need a telescope. Um, again, I think 100 millimeters or better. It also, you don't want a fast scope, okay? You don't want a scope for like deep sky imaging. You really want something with an F ratio of like six or better. Uh, none of this is written in stone, just generalities here. You definitely want to have tracking. Uh, it's just not practical to do imaging without tracking, in my opinion. <clears throat> I would say go with a color video camera as you're getting started. Um, people who are really dedicated, like James Willingham, um, he uses black and white. And the reason for that is that you can get more detail because all of the pixels, um, the, in a color camera, you have red, green, blue uh, filters like over the individual pixels. In a, in a monochrome camera, you don't. So you actually, every pixel is collecting detail, but it greatly adds to the complexity. You then have to invest in a filter wheel. When you go to process your image, it's more complex. So all I'm saying is 
color video camera is in terms of keeping it simple if you want to get into it. If you feel like jumping whole hog and doing a, a monochrome camera, more power to you. You're going to have to have a laptop. You're going to have to have some free disk space because these videos get quite large uh, for both capturing and then processing the work that you've captured. Uh, you're going to need software. Fortunately, uh, the great deal of it is open source. Uh, so you don't have to invest in that. You just got to have uh, the laptop to be able to download it. Optional, but really recommended, a UV IR cut filter. Basically, the camera will see UV and IR radiation, which is going to kind of smear the image. So if you put a filter on to block those two, it's going to improve the quality of your image. It will be sharper. The other thing is a Barlow so that you can get a little boost in magnification. You want a larger image of the planet when you're imaging it. And again, I sound like a broken record, but steady seeing makes it or breaks it. So in terms of a video camera, if you wanted to get a video camera, there are tons of providers for color video cameras. ZWO is probably the main dog out there. Celestron has them. Imaging Source, I have one of their cameras. QHY is another leader in, uh, in imaging cameras, Orion. Um, you could potentially, oh, and, and by the way, Point Scientific has a great article. Uh, and you can find a lot of stuff online in terms of uh, selecting a planetary camera, which really is a different animal than a deep sky imaging camera. Um, you could potentially, if you're really doing it on the cheap, you could try using your DSLR and taking a video with that. I don't recommend it because it's heavy. Uh, you're going to have to require, you're going to have to get a T-ring adapter anyway. And um, you, you, cannot, um, you cannot put it into bare mode. So in other words, you're going to have a color image. Um, so I don't really recommend it. I've done it with the moon. You know, it's doable, but I don't recommend it. So here's the sample of the video capture process. So the first thing you want to do, get your scope polar aligned. That's important because the longer you can keep your target in that frame, the better, the less frustration. Like I've mentioned, you want you to be collimated. If you have a Newtonian, you've got to do this. If you have a schmidt cassegrain and I'd recommend that you do it. I always align my finder scope. So once I've got things set up and I've got the planet I visually in the center, I make sure that the planet is in my crosshairs. That is so that if something happens and it, the planet leaves the field of view, I can get it back in by using my finder scope rather than having to pull off the camera and eyeball it back into position. You then insert your Barlow and your camera, check that you haven't affected the balance of the scope connect up to your laptop and you launch your capture program. There are several capture programs that you could use. And you center the planet and you focus. So here's a little video. And what I want you to watch is, as it starts, I'm focusing, I'm targeting the Galilean moon down here. Watch what happens. You know, I start to get it in and then I start bouncing around back and forth, trying to get it to a nice tight dot. OK, that's much better, much easier than doing it, you know, on uh, a feature on Jupiter or on Jupiter's limb. Um, so I definitely highly recommend that when you're focusing, go after the, the Galilean moon. Uh, and sometimes when you're imaging, you have to increase the exposure so that you can see the moon. Then in your software, in your capture software, you want to set your region of interest or ROI as small as possible. You wanna adjust the shutter and the gain for the best possible. You wanna get the fastest frame rate, but you don't wanna crank up the gain because then it's gonna get grainy. It's like cranking up your ISO in a camera setting. Um, and then you go ahead and you take your series of videos, one to two minutes, because Jupiter rotates so fast, you don't wanna go beyond one or two minutes because the planet's rotation will end up smearing things. So here's another video that we'll take a look at. And first of all, you can see that this is the wide field. So I'm going to narrow down to a small region of interest like I just did here. And that then basically uh, enables my frame rate to go up because I'm not taking as much data from all over. You can see I'm adjusting here, trying to get the exposure right, adjusting the gain, 
and the shutter. And then last thing I'll do is I'll click off the color so that I'm doing it, <coughs> capturing it in black and white because that also uh, saves disk space by doing that. So now we've got our image, we've got our uh, video file. First thing that I will run it through is something called PIPP, Planetary Imaging Preprocessor. The function of this is it will debear or make colorized my video. It will restore the color back to the video. It will center my target. It will crop the frames, make them smaller, and it will extract the best frames in the video. So I can define in my multiple settings here for PIPP, hey, give me the 50% best frames, you know, uh, of that here, and it will crank out and it will also order them. So when it produces its video file, frame number one is the best frame out of the entire video. Hey, Jim, what format are you recording in? AVI um, or? AVI, um, there's another format called SER, which I have heard takes up less space, but that's not been my experience. I, I tend to stick with AVI, it's more common. So we take our, our video from PIPP, and now we open up AutoStacker 3, and we give it this video, and we say, okay, I want you to select the 30% best frames out of this video. Now it's already the 50% best, and now I'm gonna take just the 30% of the 50%. You can do up to four different levels. So I could do 10, 20, 30, 40, and just kind of see, because the more frames, you decrease some of the graininess, but you also then are adding in mushier, mushier ridges. So a little bit of a balancing act. I ask uh, AutoStacker to give me a sharpened image as well as the raw stacked image. I always select RGB align. Basically, the atmosphere, we talked about the ultraviolet and the infrared smearing. Well, even the blue light and the red light, especially if the planet is a little bit lower on the horizon, you have atmospheric dispersion. And that will, again, tend to kind of smear out some of the features. This RGB line tries to put them back together from a software standpoint. You then set how large you want your uh, alignment point to be. Um, I, you know, it, again, I, I, I tend to think somewhere around 40 or 48 is good for my Jupiter. You know, you can play around with it and figure out what works for you. And then I ask the software to go ahead and place the grids. You can do this manually, but I have found that it's easy and it usually gives a good result. But whatever floats your boat, if you wanna do it manually, you can do that as well. We then kick it off, click stack, and it will start to run. You can watch the progress. And when it's done, this is what you end up with. On the left is the, the raw image, if you will, the 30% best images stacked and aligned. On the right, here's the one that is slightly sharpened. So a lot of times what I'll do, I will actually you know, get my first video of Jupiter. And while I'm getting my second video, I'll do this stuff. I'll do this processing so that I can get this picture here and I can kind of quickly gauge, okay, hey, my focus is on, I've got a good focus. My seeing's pretty good tonight gives me some feedback when I'm uh, sitting chair side at the telescope. Then we go to Registax, which we take that image from AutoStacker. And here, a little bit of uh, what I like to call black magic and art. You end up twiddling with these uh, dials here and you end up trying to sharpen your image without making it look artificial or gross. And so after a while, you can end up with what you feel is a good representation, you know, a natural, you know, hopefully haven't introduced any artifacts, you know, to the planet. Uh, you can then save that so you can apply it then to all of your other uh, one minute videos. And then finally, you want some sort of a photo editing application. I happen to have Photoshop. And the idea here is go ahead and tweak it to try to bring out a little bit more in the contrast and, you know, just really kind of make it pop a little bit, again, without damaging and making artifacts there. So that is the lucky imaging process in a nutshell. Um, so let's wrap up here with, I don't have a telescope. I don't know that I'm gonna get a telescope. Uh, what can you do to still enjoy Jupiter and kind of be a part of it? 
So one of the things is there's a, one of these Zoomiverse uh, uh, applications out there called Jovian Vortex Hunter. It's very cool what you do, you sign up and register and all that. They will show you a small image from Juno. And your job is to decide whether there is a vortex, you know, a, a circular storm. Is there a turbulent region? Do you see a cloud band? Or is the image featureless? Or it's just too distorted or pixelated to see? Um, and you can actually also leave a comment uh, and have some interaction with other people. So that's kind of cool. It's something that you can enjoy doing, kind of seeing firsthand and knowing that you're helping uh, the Juno team kind of classify things because there's just so much data that's coming back. You can also download WinJupos, which is a fairly sophisticated but free program. And it would allow you to kind of look at um, features. So you could go out to the Alpo website, to the gallery, download a couple of images and kind of play around and track, you know, how is something moving over a couple of weeks? So I'm, I'm want to look at this particular storm. I want to see how much it's moved over three weeks, or I want to see how much it's grown, things of that nature. Um, and again, this is a very sophisticated program. I don't, I don't use all of it by any means, and I'm sure that you could do an entire lecture just on WinJupos. But here's the example. So I've loaded up an image here. Let's say I want to figure out what is the latitude and longitude of this particular white outbreak in the North Equatorial Belt there? So you can see the uh, arrows on the top. That's where my Central Meridian 1 or System 1 longitude is going to appear, System 2, System 3, and then the latitude. All of those will appear as I move my mouse across the image. So let me go ahead and do that so you can see as I move this mouse, see the values changing. Okay, and then when I finally get situated over top of it, I can read out that it's at 88.8 .8 degrees longitude system one. And it was, I don't know, the video has started over again, 25, I think, degrees north. Let's see where it ends up. Nope, almost 10 degrees north. So bottom line is you can track latitude and longitude of interesting features and you can get images from places like the, uh, the Alpo website. So that's kind of fun and interesting to do. Got to be a little bit of geek though. Uh, Jim, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, if you uh, collect the uh, captures in color, so you don't need to deep air with, uh, with uh, PIP, uh, is there th still any advantage to using PIP uh, if you're going to be using auto stackers uh, later? Um, the, the main thing that PIP does, I think, is it, it kind of centers everything, and, and which, if, by the way, if you want to do an animated GIF, is great. Um, but it centers everything, which is nice. But no, I mean, and in fact, I think Jim uh, Johnson pointed out the other week that there's another program now, a new one out there, and I forget the name of it, like Planetary System Stacker, I think. Um, you could actually take just Registax and have it do the alignment, the stacking, the wavelets, you know, everything. Um, you know, I just basically pointed out my workflow, what works for me, but no, uh, PIPP is not a prerequisite. You don't have to use it. You know, if you find that you like the features that it's offering, you know, then definitely include it in your workflow. Jim, I'm using uh, PIPP ahead of uh, that new program that you mentioned, uh, Planetary System Stacker. I just feel better about it, having run it through that. Well, that's, that's good to hear that you, uh, you agree and use it also. I, I like it. I like it a lot. So a final way that if you're an armchair astronomer, you could join the Alpo Jupiter groups.io. Um, basically, you uh, get to see, you, get a, you can get a daily email digest or uh, as they come in. And you get to see images from folks like Christopher Go out of the Philippines or um, just all sorts of really fabulous uh, amateur astronomers who are doing great Jupiter work. And sometimes discussions break out as well. So that's kind of a fun thing to follow along.
All right, so I'm gonna just kind of walk through the resources here very quickly because you'll have this slide deck just so that you know what's out here so that when you, uh, if you wanna uh, get uh, a resource here, you'll know that it's available in the slide deck. So Alpo, I'm very fond of Alpo. Like I said, I am currently uh, the guy who posts all of these images to their galleries. Um, great organization, it's 18 bucks a year. You get their journal, which comes out quarterly. Um, you can go to the Alpo Gallery, uh, which you don't have to be a member. You can go there and look over the images. And they also have an annual conference. Again, you don't have to be a member if you want to attend via YouTube. If you want to be a Zoom attendee and be able to ask and interact with the presenter, then you do have to be a member for that. All right, other organizations, the British Astronomical Organization, they do a crackerjack job with Jupiter. Uh, Dr. John Rogers is always on his game talking about what's new with Jupiter. Japan Alpo, another great resource. Those guys put together phenomenal like strip maps like every couple of weeks. They basically, if you send your images to them, they kind of use that to, to generate these maps. Great resource. You can also participate in the Jupiter impact detection software. So if something like an asteroid or a small, large meteor crashes into Jupiter and creates one of those flashes, there is software. You can run your videos through the software to see if it picks up any particular changes that might represent a, uh, a flash because you're not going to be studying the screen for you know an hour while you're downloading and, and capturing these videos. Uh, we were talking about resources. You can get the Great Red Spot Transit Times from Sky and Telescope. You can get uh, the Galilean moon events from Sky and Telescope. And if you want to know what the central meridians are at a particular date and time, there's another resource for that. Uh, here are some of the uh, softwares that I talked about this evening. And again, uh, everything with the exception for Photoshop is free. You can download. Um, the ASI Studio is for the ZWO cameras only. Uh, the Astronomical League has a Jupiter observing program. You could certainly pick up on that and participate in that if you care to earn that certificate. Uh, Juno, if you are capturing images, they would love to have your images because it helps them in planning on the next perigee what sort of features might be visible, what they might be interested in zoning in on. And we already mentioned the uh, Jovian Vortex Hunter and the Alpo Group's IO. So I'm gonna wrap up by basically making an offer here. So for years, Alpo has provided training for our members uh, to sharpen their observing IP skills. And if you still, and, and if you'd like observing from the eyepiece, I really recommend Tim Robinson does a great job with that program, really helps to sharpen your skill set. But we want to start to explore, can we do the same sort of thing with an imaging training program for our members? And what we need to do, we got to evaluate first off, what sort of resources are helpful to the new imager, as well as figure out how much time a mentor is going to end up spending trying to help uh, the mentee to, to figure out imaging and to get started on it. So I do have an old camera uh, that uh, if you want to borrow for this initiative, uh, you, I would be happy to lend it to you for a month to six weeks. So if you are a member of HAL and you want to explore starting to image Jupiter, um, I've got this particular, and I'll post it in the link here in a minute. I've got a little online form. Just let me know, you know, tell me your interest. And to a degree, it's going to be first come, first serve, you know, and uh We'll see if we can get some of you guys who are, or ladies who are interested in and in, in, in doing lucky imaging uh, kind of get you started on that path. And that, folks, I believe is it. Wow. Great job, Jim. Um, telling you uh, that is quite a tutorial. Um, you know, as I pointed out at the beginning of the meeting, this meeting is being recorded. I think I'm going to take the recording and try and clip out your uh, presentation here and post it again as you know, just the Jupiter tutorial. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that not only to all the research and how well prepared and presented it was, but that you fully incorporated observational observing along with imaging um, because, you know, we have... Uh, people across the gambit uh, on how they uh, enjoy the hobby. 
So it was, it was just, and then all the resources and everything. And you, you can, I think it touched on all points. I don't know Great. if you missed anything, but uh, anybody have any uh, comments or questions for Jim, please unmute and go ahead. Jim, just an observation. It, it seemed like you actually had a, a, one of those sketches going back to 1997. So you've been doing this for like 25 years? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been doing it for many years. Wow. Um, I was I was actually a lot more active in the late 80s and through the 90s and then life interfered and kind of fell off doing some of it. And when I got back into, into the early 2000s at that point, the uh, imaging, lucky imaging revolution was happening. And I was like, well, the eyes are getting a little harder, you know, to see stuff. And, you know, the imaging looked really cool. So I got into that. But I still love imaging. I mean, I, I still love eyepiece observing. Um, the other night when I was out, while I was doing the imaging, I had my six inch set up and I was doing visual observing a Jupiter with that. So, yeah, I, I love it. I have to tell everybody, if you have the benefit uh... Uh, owning a bino viewer for your telescope um, and uh, and you could look at it with both eyes and get that 3d uh, um, effect uh, on Jupiter it's pretty spectacular um, and yeah and it also helped with you being able to see some of these uh, some of these objects and because Jupiter is so bright in itself even though you kind of cut your light gathering down with the with the bino viewer it doesn't matter it actually helps something so Anything else for Jim? Well, thank you, Jim. That was just awesome. Thank you, guys. That's awesome. You know, um, a lot to take in, and I'm and I'm glad we're recording. And I'll make a note of uh, posting this out to the to the HAL membership that it's there, and everybody should you know get in there and take a look at it. And I'll get the slides over to Ken by the weekend. Thank you. All right. Let me go back to sharing my screen. And so we're always looking for help uh, in finding good speakers or and uh, presenters. So once again, at the um, on the HAL website, we have a, a form there. And you can see down here on the bottom where it says suggest a speaker, puts this in there and um, go ahead and hit submit. And it'll come over to the leadership team and we'll begin following up or you could follow up uh, you just it's all all the um, options and questions and stuff are in the form here so please uh, if you know of anybody or somebody you want to approach uh, just fill out this form and and send it in and with that I'm just going to give you guys a, a quick uh, real quick overview of I last month uh, you know Victor uh, was kind enough to run the meeting and uh, because I was away on vacation, I happened to be uh, in uh, England and then over to Paris. But while I was uh, there, I stopped at the British Museum. And there was a couple of very uh, interesting things. One uh, was this Sloan Astro Lab, which you see up there in the top, which is from around the, uh, the year 1300. And uh, you can't make out the detail on that, but um, in this, in this uh, smaller picture here, but basically it's a flat view of the alignment of the planets, the stars and other features that they were able to see then. And it's an incredible condition and incredible detail, uh, especially going back to, to 1300. And we only have a couple of members that were around then that are still active today. So, uh, but I won't name anybody, David Illig. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, and Bob, so, um, and then they had an, uh, an orrery down there um, from 1750. And, um, you know, one of the first things you notice is the most distant planet on there is Saturn. And, um, but even then going back, it's uh, the accuracy of these devices when you think about it. Um, is uh, well, uh, Excuse me, are, are, you, are you suggesting that Saturn is not the most distant planet because I haven't seen anything new since I built that thing. <laughs> you should Google other planets and you can see. Yeah, so uh, yeah. And David, you did a great job of building it. And then uh, there on the right in the museum was these um, two telescope tubes, which are um, from the 
uh, second half of the 17th century was the, the best thing to do. Though there was no optics in there because the uh, person who owned these uh, stored the, uh, the, the lenses separately. There was a lens in the front and a lens in the back. And um, and they weren't stored together, so these are just the tubes without the without without any optics. So pretty pretty interesting there. And then I know Victor showed uh, me standing in front of uh, uh, with my back with the back of my feet on the grass there, uh, and uh, creeping into the rope uh, over a Stonehenge. And um, uh, yeah, yes, it is a bunch of rocks just standing up there. But when you do the research ahead of time. And you get out there, it's pretty amazing. And there's a there's a really nice visitor center out there with a lot of detail, a lot of uh, items and artifacts that they moved back from the British Museum out to this um, out to this museum they have on site now. And it was really hot. It was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit that day. And it's, you, a, it's a long walk. It's impressive that you made the walk all the way out over there. Yeah, well, we took a bus because they had the visitor center because the, there was no way to walk. It was it was so hot. And there's absolutely no shade anywhere. In fact, this would be an awesome place to have a star party. Um, of course, you know, being hell, we would plan and get out there and it would rain. But uh, uh, but it, to, to be able to do some imaging with um, Stonehenge in the foreground would just be just be incredible. But it is very impressive. And um, if you're into this stuff and just to try and imagine them hauling these these giant stones as far as they did over so many years and then to get them set up and stacked and everything else like that. Um, it's, it was pretty good. So it was a bucket list thing, never have a reason to go back. Once you've seen it, you've seen it, but it's pretty cool. So that's just kind of a highlight from, uh, as we work into, the, oh, there's another another angle. See the you can see it was a it was a crystal clear day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, and that I will tell you, a couple of clouds would have been welcome. It was, Beautiful. It was so hot. Hey Phil. Yeah. You talked about that astrolabe at the uh, British Museum. In my uh, collected works of uh, Chaucer, they have we have the oldest user's manual known to man, uh, dating from the year thirteen hundred. It's wow. twenty five pages long, and it's how to use that thing. Wow, I'd be interested in seeing that, Bob. So next time we get together, if you remember to throw it in your car. Yeah, I'll bring it to the meeting. Okay. Or to a to a to a start party. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, so moving on. Time for our our Howard uh, our, our Howard Astro Howard Astronomical League pictures. And these are from Ian. They're in no particular order. So, uh, no. Uh, yeah, these are, uh, well, they're, they're labeled as, these are with my 11 inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain from West Virginia and mm -hmm. uh, used an, a Celestron Next Image 5 camera. It's a very, I guess, sort of basic camera. And uh, uh, I think the seeing was uh, not very good. Uh, and I have a question for, some of the experienced guys, uh, I, I cropped it out, but I get this uh, purple line on some of the processing. It's, you know, at the bottom and top of a, a, an image and I can, I kind of cropped it out, but I don't know why that happens. Is it a straight line? Yeah, uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, it's not, uh, I I think it may yeah, be no, a I, framing. I, I think it may be a framing line that comes when you're stacking the images. It's actually reduced. It's uh, yeah. it, because they're different. The, the quality in each one of them are different, so it, it averages out where that that frame line is. And so cropping it out is the right way. Uh, does anybody yeah. agree with that or have a different? Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I would be curious whether did you use PIPP before you did this? Not in this case, no. So that might, you know, it would be interesting if you still have the the raw AVI would be yeah, to try I, using I PIP, you know, kind of let it do the crop and centering and see if it's still there. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. And Jim, these are yours. Beautiful. Yeah. Just had, uh, like I said, we had some. Uh, the weather wasn't nice during the day because it was so darn hot, but in the evening, really some great steady seeing. So. You know, just a little 
uh, here and there, Jupiter, Saturn, was surprised that little tiny pockmark that you can barely make out there on Mars, that's actually Olympus Mons. And um, so just really cool, love this stuff. And you also have that uh, Ganymede over by Jupiter there that you could actually see yep. the, uh, some of the, uh, the, the dusting and the surface uh, features, if you will. Yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. And uh, here we have, uh, James is, in, is not on today, but here's some images that he submitted of Saturn and Jupiter. He's always a crowd pleaser also. And then uh, Richard's not on. So this is a sketch. Um, what Richard does is he sketches. And uh, you, um, many of you, if not most of you, have heard me say this before, that if you start sketching, you're going to become a tremendous observer. Um, because you have to really study what you're looking at in order to be able to transfer it over onto a, a, a piece of paper. And then what he does is he then takes it and he scans it into the computer and, and um, does a little sharpening there. And that's how he comes up with these things. But uh, this one here is of um, the uh, um, diffusive emission uh, reflection and nebula complex. Uh, and it's very, very, very faint, but he's got the new uh, Teleview night vision uh, and system. And he uses also a six nanometer hydrogen alpha filter with that. And he's able to pull this out. And this device is truly, really, I mean, amazingly um, exciting to look through. It takes uh, light polluted skies and all of a sudden from looking at a few, you're looking at thousands and, uh, and you can pull up all kinds of cool things. So I've actually ordered one. So hopefully it's, well, it's supposed to arrive in December or January. But uh, so that's how he did this and it's pretty cool. Another one he did here, um, not with the night vision, but he uh, did you know quite a few um, different objects all in, in one capture, uh, all sketched. And um, you know Richard uh, uh, sends these out as emails to the group a lot of times, otherwise you can find it on the Flickr site. Uh, for Richard Orr, but it's quite a bit of detail there. And then Thorne, are you on? <sighs> so you can read up on the top there what the Thorne's done here, and it's really very cool. At first, I thought he spilled a cup of coffee on the uh, on, on, on his on his optics, but uh, it's a really a great amount of detail there. Oh, wow. And. And this one, the Wayne. one, Wayne, are you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. So this is the Discord object of the month capture that I've collected. Uh, this is the Eastern Veil Nebula. Uh, so it's not the witch's room, it's the other part. Uh, the bat wing, this is part of the bat wing nebula. The bat's kind of off the bottom left of the image. So this is a narrow band image with uh, H-alpha, sulfur-2, and oxygen-3. Uh, the sulfur is red, H alpha is green, and oxygen is blue. And so this is about seven hours and 40 minutes total exposure time, taken over two nights from Alpha Ridge. So what I really want to talk about a little bit here, if I can, is a little bit of the astrophysics. Uh, in particular, up toward the top, you can see that the blue is well separated from the green and red. And so remember blue is the oxygen three and the red, the green is H alpha and the red is sulfur. So what we're seeing here is the emission from oxygen three is occurring in different physical locations within the nebula than the hydrogen and the sulfur emissions. So there's a number of ways this could happen, uh, but and one of them would be that, well, all the oxygen is out front and the hydrogen and sulfur is uh, lagging behind, if you will, if it, you imagine this shell expanding to the upper left. But that's not really very satisfying because there's no easy way to separate the oxygen from the other atomic species. So they're probably all well mixed together. In fact, if you look to the upper left from that there's a, a very, very thin ribbon of hydrogen 
running from the to kind of diagonally down. So there's no reason to believe the oxygen is separated. So really what we're finding out is, is that there are different physical conditions in the area where the oxygen is being emitted rather, uh, compared to the hydrogen and sulfur. And if you go look up in a big book or Google it, you find out that the oxygen requires about almost over two and a half times the amount of energy to ionize from oxygen two to oxygen three than it takes to ionize hydrogen from its ox hydrogen one to hydrogen two, okay. neutral to ionized. And so what you're finding out is, is that the oxygen is takes a different physical conditions. And if you carefully study these kinds of images, you can actually start learning about what the different physical conditions are and then start applying uh, that information, that knowledge to what's going on within the nebulosity. So a little bit of astrophysics here. Oh, it's great. Is, so, that just, is that just stars that are more or less energetic near that region or? No, uh, that's one way to get some separation here is photo or to ionize stuff is uh, there's photo ionization, which is from stars, from light, but this is actually being done by shocks. And so we've got different temperature and pressure regions. Okay, so so this is this is not an emission nebula like you normally think about. This is ca being caused by shocks rather than by uh, photo ionization. Very cool. So my actually, if you go back just real quick, my favorite part of the image is kind of over to the left middle kind of almost perpendicular to the main. Yeah, that area there is very almost cirrus cloud-like. Looks like it's precipitating cirrus. That's just really pretty to me. Mm. OK, thanks. Yeah, cool. Kurt, are you on? I think Kurt went out with his telescope anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame him. Yeah, well, here's a really nice picture that he put out. And then uh, Jim Lane, are you on? Yep, I'm here. Hey, yeah. All right. Yep. So yeah, thanks for putting them like this, Phil. It looks a lot better than uh, one at a time. So the this was a uh, Friday night into Saturday this past this past week, right at the peak of the Perseid meter shower. I took a, a Nikon camera with a fisheye lens on the deck, and took. Uh, oh, yeah, Phil, thanks for typing that up, man. I appreciate that. I can't I can't see the tiny. I just made it out. Sorry. Um, it's a five second exposure every 10 seconds all night long from about 9.30 till about 5.30 in the morning, 9.30 at night till 5.30 the next morning. Um, and then make, I make movies out of them because it's much easier to, to uh, you know, I take all the JPEGs and just make a, a, like a stop motion video and then just kind of like just sit there and look at it, you know, for a little bit and find a couple of meteors, one on the left, just a nice long streak with a kind of the telltale head the pot, kind of the pop at the end of it yep right there thanks and then the next one blew me away and i farmed this out to a couple folks um that that do more with meteors and stuff like that than i do and they were equally as blown away and they said they've never seen one that bright captured like mid capture you know so um this as you could see is lit up my trees in my front yard I'm not yet ruling out. It's not a meteor, if that makes sense, two double negatives. If anyone has any other thoughts that what this might be, but um, we get plenty of aircraft around here as we know what those look like. I don't think it's a landing light. I was just stunned at like how bright this was and happened to capture it right as it was going over the house uh, in the clear and was bright enough to light up the, my tree leaves and put some lens flare and all the all the uh, you know lens components inside that fish eye. So yeah, this one it was totally worth <laughs> totally worth its weight here doing that. That, that uh, five second exposure. Yeah, that's a all these are five second exposures. Wow. Maybe it was a police helicopter with one of those searchlights. I, I did I did consider. I mean, we, I'm in Anne Arundel County, and they, I'm not far from where they take off, but. I was kind of half in and out at this. This is twelve fifteen in the morning. I didn't hear anything. It doesn't mean it's not, but I'm not. I'm not saying that. You know, I'm just saying like 
I did consider it's a helicopter, maybe going over with the light on, just, you know, um, typical aircraft track. There's actually an aircraft track in the upper left corner of that, little green dots. There's, there's a, you know, the telltale airplanes we see um, coming in. So yeah, I thought a low helicopter or something, but, um, but it's got that bulbous flash, the pop, you know, the, the kind of the, the pop there with the tail continuation. Yeah. Well, so, if there was nothing before it or after it. Yeah, I think, yeah, thanks for what I said, yeah. Time. Nothing it, on the picture before or after. A lot of the meteors, you can see like remnants. If it's satellites, you see you see those coming across the screen. Same with airplanes. Yeah, yeah it's like, like, this is like, is there any leftover, you know? So just, yeah, this one hands down just blew me away when I, I opened it. I was like so fortunate to grab a meteor. I a, like a fireball type flash. You know, yeah. when we were out, Wayne, you know, with the group, and there were a couple that were pretty darn bright that blew in, you know, and um, I was fortunate enough to see one of them. I heard everybody else gasp when then. <laughs> yeah, I wish I was outside. And this, yeah, I've seen them fly. They look like a real low level camera flash when you're standing at like a strobe goes off and you're like, what was that? And you look up and you can see remnants. But uh, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Thanks for. Uh... Yeah, I mean, you see something like this. You know, it's not a startling trail. The startling trail would be a streak because they're still tearing through your image. But yeah. this, what you see here is when the airplane, it's, and these are exactly the same stepped apart because uh, it's the light flashing on the airplane um, mm -hmm. as they're coming in for a landing at BWI most of the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We get, I get plenty. I'm right in the path. And I'm also in the takeoff path of Dulles when it gets about 12,000 feet. Right at the same spot, same just over and over. I'm actually looking at a couple of pictures. Apparently, it was Northern Lights made their way down this far south over last night, huh? and I set the camera up again. And I didn't capture. I, I just finished reviewing the pictures. I didn't see any uh, green, telltale green. So, but uh, maybe keep trying for that another time. Yeah, so, very cool, Jim. Well, certainly the path makes it look like a Perseid if the first one at the lower left was a Perseid because they're yeah. almost parallel. And yeah. looking at the star patterns, it, the uh, upper right was just a little later than the, the left. So Yeah, Wayne, thanks. Yeah, that's good. I appreciate it. And this is, I, I didn't uh, note, this is north. So North Star is actually about where the meteor head is, is right about uh, Polaris. So Perseus was coming up. I purposely ah, comes up okay. between those two trees. Cassia, um, Cassiopeia is in for most of the night, like right in the middle, and then Perseus comes up right, right in between the trees. So yeah, see so that. Yeah, thank, I appreciate that piece. That's that's also good analysis. Yeah. All right. Cool. Is Jim? Is that a radio telescope uh, or is that for a TV? Uh, those are those are my amateur radio antennas. There's oh, three okay. on, on a tower there. Oh. Yeah, I can't. I can't get around in my yard. Everywhere I aim the fisheye, I usually grab an antenna or a tree. <laughs> so nice. Daniel's got some very nice uh, um, um, scenic shots here. Daniel, are you on? Daniel Lowen? No. Well, anyways, he did, there's he's got this one here. He did. And uh, these are his first pictures. Uh, I think maybe his first ever uh, uh, pictures of the stars. So he decided to do some scenic stuff. So a very nice uh, start, beautiful from Daniel. And Hannah has got some <laughs> cool pictures here. Hannah? Yes, I'm here. It took a little to find the mute button, but, or unmute. Um, so I also use, uh, I want to get into the physics of this too. I use a very advanced physics concept called Photoshop, specifically the sky replacement tool. Um, these are both blended images. So um, the Astro Haven here, well, let me give some background. These were taken at Cherry Springs State Park um, about at the beginning of um, August. If you're not familiar with Cherry Springs State Park, it's the closest uh, dark sky park to us. It's about four and a half hours from me in Baltimore. Um, just unbelievably spectacular views of the night sky. Uh, they have some um, no longer in use, but some empty uh, observatory domes on the campgrounds that you can see. So this was one of them. And so um, I took the picture of the Astro Haven Dome during blue hour. And then um, I want to say this is maybe like a 40 second track shot I did of uh, the galactic core um, that I blended above it. So I kind of, you know, 
like the thematic connection there. Um, and then I'm just such a sucker kind of going off of the um, observatory downs. I'm such a sucker for like the other kind of very uh, thematic element of Cherry Springs State Park, including the highway to the star signs that you see on uh, Route 44 as you're driving uh, up to the park. And those just always get me in my feel. So I made sure to stop by and take pictures of them the next day. Um, and then I blended it uh, with a picture I took of kind of, you know, the outer view of uh, the galactic core. You can see um, our friend Andromeda there. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to um, include, make this picture kind of the sky, um, ooh, make this picture the sky element of it, um, just because I like having another little galactic friend there. Um, so yeah. Very cool. Stay here. You're not, you got a couple more coming up. Now. There you go. Um, and then that was just the uh, baby moon setting um, as the sun was setting as well. So we really lucked out um, with, you know, uh, the moon status as well as uh, really good weather conditions. It did get, um, the dew did get pretty overwhelming around midnight, but before that it was really great. And it was just fun to see the nice little moon setting behind the cherry trees that uh, give the park its name. And then this uh, was a track shot I took of the core. I think this was about 70 seconds. I took this with my 50 millimeter prime lens. Um, good thing you, can you can't zoom on the picture because if you could, you could see that I did not uh, perfectly polar align my star tracker, uh, but that's okay. I also left, you can kind of see some diffraction spikes on the photos. I have a friend who, um, is uh, an astrophysics PhD candidate. And he commented and said, love the J JWST diffraction spike. So I made a joke and said that this was actually taken with the JWST, but really I'm just a sucker uh, for diffraction spikes. If you know me, I love taking artistic liberties with my photos and I just love kind of the detail we got. Um, just the dark nebula and the galactic core is some of my favorite stuff ever. It just looks like celestial webbing um, and it really blows me away, so. I'm very proud of this photo. Very nice. And you should be. Thank you. Our Zoom. Okay, so um, I think I'll start with the one on the left. It's the um, Trifid Nebula. Um, it was taken using yellow. So I had to do a bit of um, creative processing because um, there were some really strong gradients. As you can see, the bottom's a bit greener and the top is a bit more purplish. And you were in the uh, halo in our observatory for this? Yeah, um, Mr. Wayne helped me image with the halo. Um, so halo, so um, this, I had to deal with the gradients, like I said. And um, for the nebula, I had to um, enhance it. I used um, selective masking. So, um, I enhanced the nebula detail, but then made sure that the background remained natural. So um, that's the trifid. Uh, next to it, it is the um, Eagle Nebula. So I tried to submit it in time for the July object of the month, but um, the remote telescopes that were taking my photo um, took way too long. Um, I guess they just didn't like me. So took way too long for them to take this photo, but um, I finally did get it. This was um, a, a hundred second exposure using um, an H-alpha filter through an 18 inch telescope. All right, nice, Arjun. Thank you. And Chuck. So Chuck is not on, Chuck is traveling. He's actually on his way back from Denver right now. He was listening into this meeting uh, from the airport until he had a board. Um, so Chuck is a um, is quite accomplished uh, variable star. I, I would say go as far as say researcher, and he has moved his remote telescope that used to be remote in his backyard in his own observatory out to a very dark site in California, and um, here he um, captured uh, um, a supernova, and you could see it right in here. And I put up here at the top, you know, um, what what he's what he's looking at. So this is really really quite cool. And if Chuck was on, he would be able to um, give you quite a bit of detail about what's going on in each of these. And then here, which is difficult to see in this sm small spot here, but here's a 19th magnitude uh, supernova 
and it's it's right in this little spot here and I was able to blow it up earlier and and uh get a little bit more view of that but uh it's quite a quite a cool capture there so this is what Chuck does Jim Johnson this is uh crater Anaxagoras it's near the uh lunar north pole it's um, a very young crater with a very high albedo has an extensive but delicate um, uh, ray system. I, I captured this with a uh, one shot color camera, about 4,000 frames, um, stacked the, the best 600 in planetary system stacker. And, um, um, and I think after doing, did a couple other lunar exposures as well. I think after doing this one, I want to use um, planetary system stacker as my replacement for auto stacker and um, Registax. Yeah, very nice. Mm -hmm. Really nice. Yep. Okay, and here's one. I don't think I submitted it last month, uh, Victor, so I put it in. Uh, mm -hmm. One that I uh, took on June 30th of the sun. Mm -hmm. And the color is uh, artificial because I'm using a monochrome camera. So in uh in Lightroom, I just added this this coloring here. People seem to really like it. Uh, so it's kind of for more artistic effect, but you could see there's even though there was very there was um almost no sunspot activity in this particular image, but there was quite a few filaments and some uh, prominences around <laughs> the edge. Nothing dramatic, but pretty cool looking, nevertheless. And then this was the other morning. Um I was out walking the dog and I looked up and I said, man, the moon looks great this morning. And there was just some puffy clouds around. And I came in my, they came in the house to get my camera and put the big lens on it. And when I went out, it was completely gone. A cloud had covered it. And I said, <laughs> so I had to wait a few minutes for it to clear out again, but uh, I got, you know, uh, really good detail. And uh, many of you see that, uh, saw this on, um, on in the he hell email uh, group because I uh, put it up there. But, you know, as I said in the uh, one of the emails, um, the seas, you know, the, the Sea of Tranquility and others in the blue sky, and it looks like blue water, I could see where you would call it a sea. But it's pretty cool looking. Is that a lucky imaging uh, sequence? Or? This this one shot. One shot, nice. A one shot image uh, with um, my Canon, um, uh, 5D Mark IV with a uh, 600 millimeter Sigma uh, zoom lens on there. Handheld or tripod? Handheld. It was a very fast shot. In fact, uh, if you look on a- That's impressive. Like a, what's that? That's impressive. Yeah. So um, it was really, really good. I was really impressed with that lens. Um, you know, it's really nice to be able to afford to get lenses that cost thousands of dollars. This was one that cost less than a thousand and came up with this image and um, it continually performs. But uh, yeah, and when, it, when I blow it up, it holds. I mean, it doesn't uh, pixelate, you know, those those craters would get sharper and sharper. So um, um, I just left it at this uh, with this much background stuff because it was the, it was the best um, visual effect for a, a beautiful picture. But um, yeah, but I was, I've taken moonshots during the day before, but I, this is the best one that that for from me. Um, I really was quite amazed at how much how well it came out. So, without a telescope, and I believe that's it. So uh, yeah, and so I just want to say thank you everybody for participating. Uh, does anybody have anything else you'd like to add or uh, talk about? Yeah. So with that said, I, I have something, which that? is I, uh, the other night, uh, last night or the night before, I thought I was looking at an ISS pass, and I think I saw a uh, Tiang Gong, uh, the, the Chinese space. Has anybody else noticed uh, a very, very bright uh, satellite uh, pass? Um, I just looked on Heavens Above or one of those apps, and I, I think I saw the Chinese space station for the first time. It, completely surprised me. I thought I was I, I, I thought I was looking at the ISS because it was so bright. I don't know if anybody's been following or has seen that. 
Well, I thought they recently deorbited that. Is that am I wrong? Maybe I'm. Maybe no. I'm... I think they just added to it, and made it bigger. Ah, yeah. Hmm. They like doubled its interior volume or something like that. Yeah, well, it was it was pretty bright. I uh, I, I didn't know if uh, I guess that's a new one for me. Yeah, you know, we'll maybe have to start uh, doing a little bit of uh, research ahead of time and seeing if we find out when it's coming, like we do with the ISS, and we know when that's coming. So I am going to officially end the meeting and stop the recording you know, right now. And then we can continue talking as long as everybody wants to stay on. So thank you, everybody. And have a great night. Jim Tomney.